be with you. Also the glory of the Lord has risen upon us.
Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was received by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to the church. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord.
filled into your, your church, our church. We thank you for the leadership of the church in this country and across the world. We pray that your spirit breathes and fire and power through the church, that your church is a beacon for goodness, for godliness, and guides all communities to do your work. We Lord, we bring to you our congregation. We bring to you our worries and our concerns. We know that you hear. We know that you hold our worries, our fears, our sadness. We bring to you everything that is laid on our hearts. We bring to you ash, we bring to you love. We bring to you food. We bring to everyone who needs your healing, we bring to you help. We bring to you all those on our list who know your needs. We thank you that you know our needs and we meet our needs. And Lord, we bring to you our celebrations. We bring to you the joy of birthdays, the excitement of house moves and starting school. You are there in our good times, and we thank you, Lord, for all goodness of those in you. Lord, we bring to you the news, and, the, 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 and we bring to you grief and loss, and we bring to you the family of half back with it, and we bring to you what we hear on the news about people who have died, in sad and tragic events. We bring to you our need for comfort and peace. And we thank you. We thank you that your sacrifice, your son dying and raising to life gives us an eternal view of all these events that are so hard to understand. From an earthly perspective. We pray, Lord, that the knowledge of the resurrection brings comfort and peace to all those who mourn. Amen. And we bring our prayers together to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Jesus said, Make the people sit down. 
There's a nice carpet of green grass in this place. They sat down, about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the bread and having given thanks, gave it to those who were seated. He did the same with the fish. All ate as much as they wanted. When the people had eaten their fill, he said to the disciples, Gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. They went to work and filled twelve large baskets with leftovers from the five barley loaves. People realised that God was at work among them in what Jesus had just done. And this is the word of the Lord. I've just come back from New Wine. And I thought I might bring some of it back with me. Because, you see, this story is really about a little boy, isn't it? About a little boy who's got a picnic. And if I can do it properly, I might be able to help bring a little boy to life. We have got his name, just in case you're wondering, is Jimmy. He's called Jimmy because all my grandchildren are called James. Callum James, Michael James, Samuel James. So he's Jimmy. Are you going to say hello to him? Okay. Hello. <laughs> hello. Jimmy is the little boy who brought the picnic to Jesus. I'm not very good with puppets, so that's about it now. You can <laughs> see him. But um, somebody else was going to have to learn how to do that. And I have in mind certain younger people in the congregation who are doing that. I love this story because you can really use your imagination with it. Thinking about who was in the crowd, not just Jimmy, but all the others. Where it was, was it near a village or out in the sticks? What was Jesus thinking about as he sat down and then looked to see this massive crowd coming towards him? It must have been like a football crowd swarming down a street towards a stadium. I think you can sit down. This was the reading that I had for the very first sermon I ever preached, which was about 150 years ago. <laughs> then I was intrigued by who was the little boy. Did he have anyone with him? Where did he live? I think those questions are still relevant. Who was the lad and what effect did the miracle have that happened to his picnic have on him? Did he grow up believing in Jesus? Did he become a disciple when his mother allowed him to go leave, allowed him to leave home? And so how old was he? Was he the age of Sophie and Darcy or Benji even? But today I want to leave the lad to one side and concentrate on the disciples, especially Philip and Andrew. After all, that we too are disciples of Jesus. We too are following him in our lives. First of all, we have Philip, who probably was standing next to Jesus when Jesus looked out and surveyed the scene with all the crowds. Philip would have seen about 5,000 men and also the women and children all swarming over the hillside trying to get the best seats so they could see and hear what was going on. The kids would have been playing rolling down the hill, and the babies would have been yelling for their feeds, and the mums and dads would have been shouting at the kids to pack it in. And Jesus would have simply gazed on them all, enjoying having them with him. In the other Gospels, they say that Jesus taught the people first, before he fed them, but here, he seems to be simply enjoying having them there. He loves them, just as his Father God 
loves them. Then he turns to the disciples standing next to him and says, well, they need feeding, what are we going to do about it? If they'd lived in our time, maybe he would have suggested buying pizza instead of bread or even McDonald's. Jesus always seems to me to want to give to the people around him and to serve them in little things as well as the big things. I think it's got something to do with having a lot of love in him. But poor Philip, he was nonplussed. What on earth would, you know, where on earth would they find money to buy 3,000 men enough to eat? The disciples aren't exactly rolling in it. They haven't been to their jobs in months. They're surviving on handouts themselves. And then Andrew comes up with this little lad and his basket of food. Andrew has been chatting to the people in the crowd. He hasn't targeted the older, more important men to talk to. He has befriended a completely insignificant child who nobody else has noticed. And the boy offers the food to Jesus. Andrew and the boy understand Jesus. They hear that the crowd are going to get hungry and that their master, the rabbi, will attend to the problem. I haven't a clue how he's going to do it, but that doesn't matter. They offer their contribution and then have the faith to accept whatever happens next. Philip knows that Jesus is right. The people need feeding. But instead of saying, okay Jesus, whatever happens next, and trust that it will be good, okay, he starts to worry and fret that he, Philip, can't solve the problem. What happens next must have shouted out clues to any Jewish person listening and watching, because just like Moses in the desert, Jesus provides manna from heaven in the form of bread and fish, enough for everyone to be satisfied, and so much extra as well. The Gospel writer John points out that it was nearly Passover. The festival celebrates not only the release of the Hebrews from Egypt, but also their travels in the desert, where they are honed into the strongest set of tribes that eventually settle in the Holy Land. And God provides for their daily food, manna and quails to see them through to their first harvest. This isn't just about feeding a lot of people who have traipsed around after Jesus without any provisions for them. It is much more about showing that God, that the God that looked after them in the desert, is now in front of them, feeding them, still loving them. Only now he has the frame of human, Jesus of the Son of God. So, how did Jesus do it? How did he make five loaves and two fish spread so far? There used to be a speculation that because the little boy gave his food, everyone else brought out their food and began to share it. Sounds like a good idea, but it doesn't ring true to me. The crowd wouldn't have been astonished and awestruck just because their neighbour gave them a sandwich. And someone who can produce gallons and gallons of wine at a wedding would find it easy peasy to simply produce fish finger sarnies for a crowd. I don't know if Jesus would have provided too much ketchup to go with it. But if it had been invented in those days, I wouldn't have been surprised. The thing is, the same applies to us. God is constant and true and will help us in need. It is unlikely but not impossible that Jesus would put a fish supper on the table in front of you if you were hungry. It is much more likely that he will send a, a friend, a disciple, to show you how to use the food bank or the food pantry. He will send someone that believes in God to help you with housing and medical care. He will befriend you with someone that loves God 
and therefore loves you. And what's more, because you're one of his disciples, because you're one of his friends, he will encourage you to go and help the people that are in need, who need to feel God's love in their lives. And he will give you the bread and the fish if necessary, so that you can be his hands pouring out love into the world.